So what is the biggest minotaur that you've faced in your life? Biggest minotaur I have faced in my life, um, really kind of a bit weird, I think, uh, for me, uh, which is that the fear of having children who did not have a father growing up. Wow. Um, I grew up having seen way too many of my friends grow um, into their teens and thereafter without having a father around, typically because um, uh, that father had passed away. Um, cardiac wow. arrest, cancer, or what have you. And I could see the impact that had on my friends. And really from my late teens onward, I was like, but if I ever have children, when I have children, whatever, you know, I, I need to look after myself, like look after my health and be around until they hit adulthood at least. Uh, and so my eldest just turned 18 and it was a relief because one out of three is done. I've still got to be there for two out of the three, but one out of the three is done. Um, and then, uh, we'll see where that goes. But I think, you know, it's had an impact on my lifestyle, on my diet, on my fitness, on well-being. It's actually an important part of my routine. Brilliant. I mean, that's quite deep to start off with. Um, so we'll get into that in a bit more detail, but I'd like to welcome the audience to the Minotaur's Mayors podcast. My guest today is Dr. Sakib Qureshi, who is the founder and CEO of Building Capital Inc., which is one of Canada's largest developers of student housing having developed more than $100 million worth of real estate. More recently, he has uh, founded an angel investment firm having investments in multiple sectors and continents. Prior to that, he was the uh, he worked for HSP Investment Bank, McKinsey & Co. and the Dubai government. He has also authored three books, the most recent of which is called Being Muslim Today, He's also a fellow at the London School of Economics and has a PhD in international relations and epistemology. Dr. Sakib, thank you for being here and welcome. No, thank you very much for hosting me. Thank you so much. Um, so there's quite obviously uh, great credibility behind there. Is there anything I missed out in, in the introduction or is there anything else you'd like to add before we dive deep into the conversation? Yeah, no, you missed one important piece, which is that I'm a master tea, rich tea dunker. So I <laughs> okay, have a great sense as to how long a rich tea biscuit needs to be dunked in tea for before it breaks or it crumbles. So I'm pretty good at that too. Excellent. Brilliant. Brilliant. So I've seen you on obviously LinkedIn now recently. Uh, you've, you know, you've started to create a lot more content now. Um, and I think I saw one of your posts where you said, you know, you've been building in the background for 30 years um, and, 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 you know, your friends encourage you to come out on social media. So what was the drive for you to get yourself out on social media and what is the message that you really want to convey out to, to the world? The, the main, the main driver of my coming out, so to speak, into social media, having been very, very quiet on it was the realization that a whole new younger generation of Muslims in the West, in particularly the UK, Canada and the US had very, very few people to look up to which might sound a bit pretentious, but then a number of people pointed out to me and said, look, Sarkip, you know, put humility aside, but you've actually done quite well and you ought to be getting out there so that other people who are 20, 30 years younger than you, 35 years younger than you can look up to you and say, hey, you know what? If that Muppet head can do so well and he's brown and Muslim, then maybe I can do well too. You know, And so that was the underlying thinking that I want to, be I want to get myself out there so that you know a whole new younger generation of people grow up and can point to one more person in their community or one more person who they identify with and say yeah if that guy can do it I can do it too you know and that's really important and I think I was very lucky because I had you know one or two role models in my social circle to to kind of look up to. I had one or two role models outside of my social circle to look up to, and I benefited a lot from that. And so why not kind of put humility aside a little bit and say, yeah, you know what? I don't really think I've succeeded in many things, but many people do. And so let's just put that out there and get people to kind of say, yeah, maybe I can be outstanding and brilliant way more than this person, but at least he's kind of shown me the path. 
Mm, that's interesting. So when you say you don't think you've succeeded, what then would success look like, or what would what would you need to accomplish to say, okay, I actually think I have succeeded? I mean, I'm not brilliant at anything, really. You know, I'm just like, you know, there are a few things that I know something about, and that's pretty much it. And so, you know, I've not moved the world. I've not changed lives of tens of millions of people. Uh, I do try to help out. You know, and I do a few things now and again, but there have been so, there have been so many more people who've done infinitely more than I have that this is very hard to kind of turn around and say that I'm a success story. But for some people, you know, who are younger, who've not really, you know, who've not really got out there, it's just useful to have somebody at my age who they can identify with and say, look, if, that, if this character can do a PhD, if he can work at this place, if he can write that kind of book, then maybe I can do the same thing. And I think, I mean, the fact that my eldest son and my second eldest son have both written and published books is not because wow. they grew up intrinsically believing that they were authors. They were like, you know what, if Papa can go ahead and do this, well, of course I can. You know, so they went ahead and did it. Brilliant, brilliant. And obviously, um, I'm sure you've had already an impact because we, we've been seeing the social media posts. So in your experience and when you're obviously speaking to these you know the younger generation what are the biggest challenges that they are facing um, and, and how are you helping with them so the two that i can point to is our younger generation of muslim people in particular is is growing up on the defensive they're having to answer that you identify with a religious faith you are a um, you are part of a religious faith which is violent, which is extremist, which is blah, 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 blah. Okay, so we're growing up, they're growing up on the defensive, which is complete nonsense because homicide per capita in Muslim-majority countries is lower than it is in non-Muslim-majority countries. Our religion lends itself very strongly towards peace and away from violence. And historically, Muslim fingerprints are not to be found on any of the world's worst genocides, you know, uh, traditionally, yes, there have been some exceptions, but traditionally, Muslim polities, Muslim empires and countries have been averse to mass killing, mass slaughter. You know, they just haven't taken on that cultural vibe. And so why our 20 and 15 and 25 year olds are being kind of hit with, you must, you must kind of defend yourselves against this accusation that you are part of a violent faith is wrong. It's like, so part of the reason I see that I wrote uh, being Muslim today was in response to that. I was like, I want to feed our younger generation with hard um, intellectual horsepower so that when they are confronted with that, they literally, you know, cut off those accusations really fast. So that's one thing I think which is very specific to younger generation Muslim people that we need to get out, which is that your religion is not violent. Historically, it's not been violent. And in a contemporary sense, believe it or not, Muslims are less violent than non-Muslims. Those are simple facts. Yeah. The second thing I think that it would be much more g generic to the generation than it is to our religious community is self-belief. Like there is a there is a lot to be said in adopting a bloody-minded mindset around if I want to do it, I'll do it. You know. I don't need the qualifications. I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't need excuses. If I want to do it, I'll do it. Yeah. There's a lot to be said for that attitude, which is sadly missing. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's missing. It's, it's not there. People need to embrace that spirit. And you say, fundamentally, the, the key determinant to any material success, any functional success is, is, is attitude persistence, drive, determination, self-confidence. I can do and I will do. Uh, again and again, I've seen that succeed. It's not a question of intelligence, not a question of networks or money. You know, if you want to do something, you'll do it. You know, I mean, I'm not a particularly smart person. And yet, I think I've done a lot of the things that I wanted to do. So if I can, you know, many others ought to be able to move into the same line of thinking and say, yeah, yeah, you know what? I want to do this, whether I have what it takes, whether I have the money, whether I have the network, whether, you know, all of that's irrelevant, really. It's like very secondary. It's like, 
just go ahead and do it. So number one, this theme about we should not have a younger generation being brought up on the defensive. That's just completely unacceptable. It's wrong. It's intellectually bankrupt. It's not good for our younger generation. And it's part of the reason I wrote being Muslim today. And the second second angle to it is much more generic across a generation, which is you know, stop doubting yourself. Stop filling yourself with self-doubt. Go 100% forward, not 90% forward and 10% back. That's 80% forwards. Or 70% forwards and 30% back. Well, that's 40 percent forwards go a hundred percent forwards um and it can be done brilliant brilliant and it's interesting because one of the themes of this podcast has been you know, trying to raise self-esteem issues and self-doubt in your opinion what do you think is the cause of this self-esteem crisis why are so many people suffering from self-esteem and self-worth issues uh what would you say is the cause and what then would you say is the practical steps somebody can take to um, overcome this and develop themselves I don't really know why our younger generations are are full are so full of self-doubt okay um, whether it's a function of social media and media continuously reminding you of what you don't have and what you lack or whether it's friends and family kind of looking at you, when you want to do something which is beyond the orthodox and kind of saying, well, that's risky um, or you can't do that, you know, I, I don't really know. Um, I don't have an answer for that. Um, in terms of the solution, it's, it really, it, it, it boils down to something as primitive and as base as simply saying, if I want to do something, I'll do it. You know, there's, it's not a question of talent. It's not a question of intelligence. It's not a question of, you know, networks and friends and who you know. It is funda It fundamentally falls down to putting aside all the perceived barriers and saying, I want to do it, I'll just do it. You know, I have what it takes. If I don't have what it takes, I will learn what it, I will learn to acquire the deficiencies, you know. I'll figure it out, but I'm not going to quit. And so... That, you know, is really bloody, I mean, it's really bloody mindedness. I mean, it's not just in an academic context or a business context. I've seen this in sports context as well. There are people who openly will tell me that I don't really think I was a most talented athlete, but I just happened to become a world-class player in my space. It's like, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, mm, excellent. Um, and, and, and in your personal journey, did you go through periods ever of crippling self-doubt or self-esteem issues or maybe when you were doubting yourself? If so, what did you personally do to, to overcome those? So I've never really experienced the... I've never, to be honest, I've never really experienced um, the question of I don't have what it takes. Uh, with the one very noticeable exception in 2018 when my father passed away and I wanted him back and I had there's nothing I could do. Like, there was nothing I could do. Like, I was completely helpless. Um, but I've never really taken on a challenge and felt that I don't have what it takes. And so I just bring it down to even if I don't have the skills and the expertise right now, either I'll go figure it out or I'll go and get somebody else to figure it out. So it will be figured out. Mm -hmm. But this kind of mindset of you know, I don't have what it takes. I've just found kind of pointless, to be honest, because I think our, I think we have much more capacity and ability than we'd like to give ourselves credit for. And sometimes I will say to people, imagine that I put a gun to your head. And now I'm giving you this task. You've got four days to get it done. Will you get it done? Yeah, you'll get it done. You know, um, I've just had a meeting with three people, actually, first thing this morning at 8 a.m., where... I outlined a bunch of things that we needed to get done. I was told, well, that'll take too long. And I said, well, no, seven days is maximum that we're going to get this. And eventually everybody was like, yeah, yeah, seven days is not, seven days is not. Yeah. And it's the kind of thing that I, I mean, not that I learned this from Steve Jobs' books, but a couple of biographies of his that I read, and I just noticed that he would go into meetings and tell people what he wanted them to do. And quite often they'd say it's impossible. And at the end of the meeting, they'd change their mind and say, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. I mean, how is that possible? I didn't really know. It's like, 
But, you know, it's fun. I mean, I think that it's fundamentally boils down to putting your mind to something and putting doubts aside because doubts won't ever help you. They just make, they just drag you. They slow your motivation. They slow everything down. You, if you go in carrying doubts, you're killing yourself. If you go in with the sense of, look, I don't really know how to do this, but I'll go bloody figure it out. I absolutely will figure it out. Because if we can get a person to the moon using less computing horsepower than in my iPhone in 1969, then I'm sure we can figure out the vast majority of objectives or goals that we are contemplating for ourselves. <laughs> no, I love, I love that. And I think it really relates, relates to something you you put content out on, on, on LinkedIn in that it's a good thing to be thrown in to the deep end. And, you know, maybe you, when you were working for the Dubai government, you were thrown into deep end for quite a few projects. Um, and I suppose people today aren't thrown into the deep end or they're not willing to be thrown into the deep end. And if they are, they just give up straight away. But in your experience, maybe you can give us a story of, of, of when you were thrown in, in, in the deep end. Why is it important to be thrown in the deep end? And, and why does that make you maybe act in a different way? Or maybe you've got so much to do that you don't have time to think and to doubt yourself. You've just got to act on it. Uh, what was your kind of experience on, on, on that? No, you're right. I think one of the characteristics about working in the Dubai government was essentially people being given extraordinary responsibility um, to do bits and pieces, which otherwise they would never have had the opportunity to undertake. And it it really, I mean, my experience in Dubai really forced me to shift gears around, you know, what was possible. I mean, I kept on seeing again and again and again, people who you know, on paper, didn't have what it takes, no qualifications in a certain space, no technical expertise, but being given phenomenal responsibility and just doing an amazing job, you know, and the thing was that they were told to figure it out. They were just told to problem solve as you go along. When I moved out here to Toronto, um, you know, Dubai's metro system was peanuts, it was like, like maybe one line and a few stops. And now, uh, 15 years on, 14 years on, it's, it's much more sophisticated than the one we have here in Toronto. You know, um, and that's been around the one over here for decades because this is kind of, let's get things going. Let's move. Let's not worry about what, what we're not capable of because we'll go figure it out on the way. Um, and I think throwing people in the deep end forces people to kind of take on bigger challenges. I mean, you're not going to, you're not going to grow if you're doing sedate, plod, you know, very easy work. You will grow when you're out of your comfort zone. And what, what better place to be than somebody telling you, okay, you've got no idea what you're doing. You, you've got no qualification in the space. Okay. You've got a couple of weeks to get this job done. When you're like, hmm, okay. Rapid, rapid learning, rapid, rapid growth, opportunity to kind of feel your new contours, your inner contours, and kind of pushing them a little bit more. That's quite enjoyable. You know, there's a real exhilaration from delivering what you thought you couldn't deliver. Like there's something quite fantastic. Because that also, by the way, cultivates this notion of I can do. Because if you once you do it once, then you can do. Like I still remember a conversation with my late PhD professor, Christopher Coker. Um and we sat down and I said, you know, I've got to get this done in three years, you know, maximum. And he was like, no, 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 you can't get it done in less than five. It'll be a real struggle. And I said, no, we've got to get it done in three. And we had the kind of bickering contest, which I still remember in his room. I still remember the little bust of Stalin that he had over his shoulder as I was talking to him. And then eventually I convinced him to outline to me what would have to happen in three months and six months and nine months and 12 months in order to get to that eventual you know, target. I did it in two years, nine months. You know, not because I'm particularly smart, not particular, not because I'm particularly well read. It's like you put your mind to it and say, okay, this is the deep end. I I now want to do something which is a bit different. And that, having accomplished that, is a bit of a internal exhilaration. Like you then begin to take on other opportunities and projects with that mindset of, well. If I could do this PhD in less than three years and my professor was like dead against the possibility of it happening, maybe I can do other things that everybody else thinks are impossible. Yeah. And so putting yourself in the deep end and kind of 
push, pushing ridiculous or well, seemingly ridiculous goals. And even if you don't get them, but get really close, that in itself is like, whoa, I can, you know, I have more capacity, more uh, uh, potential than I was giving myself credit for. <laughs> Brilliant. I love that. And and were you thrown in the deep end during your corporate career or was it when you delved into the world of entrepreneurship? And the reason I asked that is, um, obviously, there's a lot of talk these days about quite quitting and people being burnt out. Um, and it seems that stuff in the corporate world or corporate careers is uh, people are not thrown in the deep end as much anymore. Um, and, and although obviously some people are overworked um, and so they're given easier tasks and less responsibilities um, and therefore they never have the experience or never get to develop themselves by being thrown in the deep end. What was, I mean, what was your experience? Was the deep end for you during your corporate career or was it post? <laughs> no, I think you hit something spot on. Being employed doesn't really, doesn't easily lend itself to growth. I think my experience in the government in Dubai was a bit different. But certainly, uh, if compared to the work at HSBC and McKinsey, um, you know, you weren't quite in as much as the deep end. I think there is, I learned an awful lot in investment banking and I learned an awful lot more, I'd say, when I was in, when I was at McKinsey. But in terms of growth beyond that, running my own ship, starting my own ship, running it, you know, there's no two ways around it. It's like phenomenal growth curve. Um, and now what I find having run this ship is that there is a part of me which wants to do other interesting things because the learning curve has become a little bit plateaued. Hence my first book, then the second and the third on very different topics. That appetite to grow and learn and want to keep pushing boundaries. You know, so I wrote a book on strategy and, you know, everybody's like, well, what are your credentials and strategy? Well, not, I don't really have that much, so I'll still do it. I wrote a book on democracy. You know, again, no obvious credentials, but I wanted to write one. I wanted to re research and analyze and put some thoughts together. And again, on Islam, you know, so you'll have people questioning, okay, what are your credentials in Islam? And I'll be like, you know what? I don't really know if I have any, but I've got a thousand source notes, a lot of reading done here. I think I've, 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 I've produced something interesting. The publisher likes my work, got some great blurbs and reviews, you know. So that wanting to kind of grow and keep at it and do interesting things and take on challenges is still very much part of my fabric. Wow, oh, love that. And, and on the topic of, of, of your books, obviously we, we mentioned the, the most recent one, uh, being Muslim today, um, the previous one, uh, I believe, they called the Broken Contract, um, and also Reconstructing Strategy. Uh, just you know, the the first thought that came to my mind was was Alama Iqbal when when I read some of these titles in the blurb. Were those books influenced by Iqbal by any by any chance, or <laughs> am I completely off my rocker there? I'm a big fan of his work in uh, in Islamic. Uh, I wasn't maybe a decade ago, but got, I've, 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 I've gotten to appreciate him from a different lens. I certainly don't think that any of those three books. I've read that book. I mean, I've got two versions of it, and and I can say it is by far the most difficult book that I have ever read, <laughs> and it's, it's been very difficult to understand. Um, and I suppose the reason why I thought you drew inspiration is because you know I, I think the quote is self identity is the prime strategic directive, um, and obviously one of Iqbal's key concept is is the concept of hoodie and, and self identity and self expression. So that's why I thought there was a, a correlation there. So. When you say self-identity is the prime strategic directive, what, what does that mean? So how you choose to see yourself in the cold light of day, in the mirror, without pretense, 
has a fundamental impact on then how you see the world and how you see your role in it. So very simply put, if you self-identified as not good at mental arithmetic, that is going to have a profound impact on your ability to effect mental arithmetic, to do numbers in your head, your willingness to do them, uh, your sensitivity to a world around them, you know, uh, which is why it's so important for younger people to not doubt themselves. You know? Just don't go into this universe of, I am not good at, you know, um, particularly at a young age. Uh, just don't go into that universe. It's just debilitating. And so self-identity, not just it doesn't just play out with individuals, but organizations and countries as well. You know, so how a country self-identifies has a profound impact on its policies, domestic and foreign. And we see this again and again. Um, I'm not saying that the self-identity needs to be accurate, but it needs to be honest. You know, this is the way we see ourselves, rightly or wrongly. This is the way I see myself, rightly or wrongly. You know. My self, my honest self-perception um, has a big impact on what I choose to do and the universe that I see. Wow. And I love that. I love that. And sticking to that then, I mean, it, it, this probably links to, to the two kind of causes that you were talking about. And, you know, um, I suppose for the Muslim community today, is there maybe a self-worth or self-doubt issue because there's a almost a cultural crisis in terms of identity? Um, are we for example, British Western, are we Muslims or, you know, are we basically confused about what our identity should be as as Muslims in a Western society? Um, and, you know, back to the works of Iqbal and, and some of the other thinkers at the time, um, you know, Dr. Muhammad Asad, for, for example, you know, they were warning uh, people at the time saying, yes, we need to learn from the West in terms of technological advancement, but we cannot adopt the cultural thinking mind of the West. Is, is that an assessment you would have as well? Or what's your take on that? Um, I'm not entirely convinced that there's a crisis of identity amongst Muslims in the West. It's perfectly fine to be off the West, to be Muslim, to be South Asian, to be a fan of Tottenham Hotspur and a fan of rich tea biscuits. You know, it's perfectly fine to have all of those identities. Um, I don't really see much of a contradiction between being a Brit and being a Muslim. Yeah, yeah I've I never thought a real contradiction. There is space uh, within the UK, within the British self-identity for, for Islam and for my interpretation of Islam and for my being Muslim. So I don't see a contradiction there. Um, and I think the other thing that goes through my mind as you make, the, make your comments from um, Professor Asad is really this notion that um, we can segregate Western thinking from Muslim thinking. I don't think we can. I think the two have actually are so integral to each other that it's de facto impossible now for Muslims to turn around and say we can we can extrapolate Western ways of understanding um, from Islam. Let me just give you a very very small example. You keep hearing about this science of hadith. Science is based on essentially empiricism. Empiricism, as we know, epistemologically is very, very faulty. Um, and the reason we keep harping on about science of hadith is because science in the Western mindset has a particular benchmark. It's like the supreme, you know, if it's scientifically proven which completely ignores the fact that science doesn't really move incrementally. It moves through revolutions. You know? And so you've got this absurd situation that Muslims are going around talking about the science of Hadith, not realizing that the entire epistemological foundation of, of science, empiricism, is, for want of a better term, bankrupt. You know? And it's not just in the more contemporary setting that I can kind of talk about this, but... Right the way from the earliest centuries, Muslims have been engaging non-Muslim communities. I mean, theology, for instance, and philosophy came into Islam by way of questioning that took place by Christians of early Muslims. You know? And then later, having started essentially as a spiritual religion, 
there was a move towards a more theological and philosophical religion, which eventually became a more legalistic religion. <laughs> you know, how do you pull back the? How do you pull back all of those tears? I don't think you can. I don't think anybody alive today can see a Quranic document in the same way that somebody from the 8th century would have. Because the subconscious and conscious meaning-making mechanisms have changed so wildly. You know, we look at the world through a remarkably different lens <laughs> than people did eight, in the 8th century. And, and in the 1400 years of our religious changes and pathways and divergences, we've picked up nuances. And the same thing for the West. I mean, you go to St. Paul's Cathedral in London, that is an Islamic building. So Christopher Wren openly talked about his debt to mosques for the dome. Look at Westminster Cathedral, heavily influenced by mosques from, um, from Syria. Heavily influenced, you know. Um, the national French uh, symbol, the fleur, comes straight from Islamic sources. Newton's three principles were well established amongst different Muslim thinkers and writers well before he was born. How do you begin to split the two when they've literally grown up together? I don't think I don't I I I I really don't think you can do that. I think it's a bit of a mistake to assume that we can arrive at an Archimedean point of pure knowledge, of pure objectivity, because I don't think we can. We are objectivity is always subjective. You know, the glass in your hand is simultaneously a glass as it is a weapon, as it is a collection of molecules, as it is a collection of magnetic forces. Which one which one objective definition of that item in your hand, which I just call a glass, is correct? I don't really know. So objectivity is always subjective. And we're never going to get to a point where we can clean up knowledge. God knows, and which has a profoundly different interpretation. Because God, God knows, you know, we don't know. Let's not go around assuming that we have what it takes. God absolutely, knows. No, absolutely love that. Love that answer. Uh, I suppose the angle that I was probably looking at here was um, the Muslim thinking today when it comes to business. Um, and I, I did see a post of yours uh, talking about how our community's instincts need to shift rather than looking at our individual selves and looking at the community. Um, and I suppose modern day business and capitalist practice has been very cutthroat, get what you can, whereas what we were taught as, as Muslims was to be more community-oriented. community, or community oriented. Um, And certainly in my experience, I've come across a lot of Muslim business owners who talk the talk, they, they give you the salams, the mashallahs, and they've got their whole kind of reputation of, of doing good deeds. But then the business practices are very ruthless and and kind of anti-Islam, but they can't see it. And I suppose that was the angle that I was coming at. And, and based on the post that you wrote, is is that your thinking as well? Or what, what was the aim of that post that you were talking about there? Uh, no, Zulfakar, you hit a very sensitive point. We have a trust <laughs> deficit in our community for sure. Uh, Muslim to Muslims interact with a lot more suspicion uh, than they do with non-Muslims. So that's a problem that we actually have. And I think it's incumbent on my generation to help change that. Uh, how do you do that? You can't go around telling people, look, trust me, trust me. You just gotta live it out. You gotta be reliable in your word. You gotta deliver against that, blah, 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 blah. You know, so that's the, that's the headline on, on the trust deficit. Um, and the other thing that we have to change is our willingness to help. Uh, what I will say is this. Um, I've just had this experience of writing this book. So I obviously, as any publisher, so as any author, want to get people to review it, you know, to comment on it, to give me criticism, to offer a blurb maybe. What I found was my reaching out to Muslim authors, whether they were familiar or not with Islam, generated a really poor response rate. Oh. My reaching out to non-Muslims, Jews, Christians, atheists, agnostics, some of whom were real authorities on Islam, like they've written an awful lot. They teach Islamic courses at postgraduate pockets in, 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 in universities. It was very different. 
willingness to help. I'll help you. Yeah. You know what? I'll just help you. Whereas Muslim people, overwhelmingly, was a much lower ratio. And so it reminded me of something that a professor, a Muslim professor, had said to me 30 odd years ago, which is that your own community will always be the one to try and drag you down. Mm. Always. And it's, I was a bit shocked when he said that to me. I was like, hmm, it's a bit harsh. But I think it's fair. I think it's a fair comment that Muslims will not feel an intuitive sense to support other Muslims. That supporting mechanism is there among some people. I'm not denying it. But generally speaking, it's absent. You know, um, and again, if I go back to my recent experience in my book, okay, so I've got friends all over the world, all religions, um, frankly, um, except Satanism, I guess. Um, but I've had two of my friends who decided that they liked this book or like me or whatever, the relationship so much that they were going to buy more than 10 copies each. Two, <laughs> two of one's Sikh. One's Catholic. Okay. And they will distribute to friends. Mm. I know there's a business partner of mine with Muslim, very conscientious Muslim, still hasn't bought the book. important to you get communicated that people resonate with them to say yeah you know what we've got to help our own community because we're being completely messed around with because we're not doing it we're not intuitively really? there we are intuitively there to bicker criticize and drag people down and that has got to fundamentally shift because otherwise genocides happen there's a direct Absolutely. relation and, and between our un between our inability and unwillingness to work for each other, to help each other, to have that instinctive, yeah, yeah, I want to help you. Tell me how I can help you. Okay. And what's happened in Palestine? You know, and you are, it's just like shocking that people can't see that. It's like shocking that you can't see how your unwillingness to help other Muslim people as an intuitive, instinctive response, you know, how that does not get translated into a genocide. Of course it will. Will you have no representation in British politics? Why? Because you never bothered working together. Why? Because you don't want to help each other. Why? That's your problem. And that's not an easy social cultural shift to no. undertake. It's not easy. Um, it's not unendoable. It's achievable. It's been worked on by some people, and I'm happy to be part of that community. It'll take time, but it's a monster of a task. And, and what would you say is, is the cause of that? Like, why why has it got to this stage? Like, is there an emotional immaturity? Um, I suppose, for example, like, when we talk about the the state of Israel, it came into existence in 1948. At the same time, the state of Pakistan came in, in, into existence, and Pakistan was supposed to be an ideolo ideological state as well. But that kind of went into a different direction because the state of Israel had people working together within the community, whether they, when it came to Pakistan, it almost had, people go in their different ways and trying to be the big boss and trying to screw other people over and that's that was on the macro level but the same thing seems to be happening on the micro level so even like basic business around the, the streets in, in the UK you see one person will open up a, a chai shop for example and then instead of supporting that one person there's another 10 competitors on, on the same road like what do you think is the cause of us being so mistrustful within the community um, and I know you mentioned that there's some uh, schemes out there that are trying to change it. What is the way forward? How do we actually change this mentality? Uh, and it's probably going to be a generational or two shift. But what are the practical steps we can take to, to change this? Yeah, it's a huge question. Um, 
it's a you know it's a massive question um the steps that we can i mean i don't know how we've gotten to how we've gotten sorry i don't know how we've gotten to where we are like i really don't understand why that intuitive intrinsic wantingness to help other muslim people is absent so there's a piece of i mean i don't know okay uh what i think will help though is if people like me into you know we, if we put our foot out there and get out there and try and help others i mean i've been you know to the best of my time restraints i do try and help other muslims intuitively i feel you know i feel that from within okay um and i want to keep doing it and hopefully if i do it you know with 100 people in a year then that 100 will marginally shift its understanding you know and i'll make i'll maybe remind one or two particularly those who have invested a lot more time with and i'll say look you know what i'm just letting you know that i'm doing this for you because of you're part of our community so when somebody else turns up at your door in five year time asks for help or guidance i don't want you to forget what i'm doing for you like I'll, i'll occasionally mention that because i think it has a ripple effect at the moment my major kind of piece around this is that ripple effect the other thing that you know working with a bunch of people in the uk is so, you know it's early stages trying to put together kind of a more cohesive coordinated approach for the muslim community yeah that's been worked on and there's going to be a huge challenge to overcome around the trust deficit that muslims would throw at us you know as and when bits and pieces materialize but I mean all we can do is just to keep at it and eventually they are god willing they'll come a tipping point where enough people will say yeah you know what maybe I should trust these people maybe it's the right thing to do maybe they're worthy of that trust and hope it hopefully take things forward so I don't have unfortunately I don't have hard concrete answers for why we're in this mess I don't have you know a magic key to kind of unlock it as much as I would love to exercise that but I'll just say that you know if if enough people continue being helpful and wanting to help in our community without expectation of return at some point I am maybe naively optimistic but I'm optimistic that it will catch on. No, nah, brilliant and then I suppose do you think it's um uh, maybe a self esteem or ego issue cuz I, I there's so many that do want to help but when it comes to uh commercials in in my experience this is what I've noticed that. so there's been a lot of people they're willing to help they want to do something on the community they want to help so if you approach them from a place of i need help they're willing to help you but the moment it becomes a business transaction it's like a flick just gets switched and they become a completely different person and they don't realize it and they think they're completely fair and 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 what not um but even with all of these initiatives it's always this hours initiative come and join it but the moment it's like come and join ours or come join a different one it's like no 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 we want to do this one and it's almost like we want to be the leaders we want to be the pioneers we want to be the change makers and we kind of like on that state and that accolade so do you think it's an ego issue or still don't know <laughs> so certainly my experience among canadian muslims because i live in toronto and you know, i have one foot in london one in toronto i will say that the canadian muslim community is dominated or the activism is dominated by the kind of look at me crowd you have to dominate it's like they're obsessed with wanting to be validated um using muslim activism as a platform for that purpose you know so they will i mean if you ask them to sit in a car journey for 4 hours to go visit ottawa and have a handshake with the prime minister and a 20 minute call about a 20 minute conversation about muslims and the 4 hour journey back there's a long line up there's a long line of people willing to take out a full day okay that's absolute crap all for the community but there's a long line up professionals prof- professors surgeons they're all tied up you ask them to dedicate an hour of their time to actually making a difference you know and there's no kind of handshake there's no applause there's no photo op wait what just happened man they just all went they all and I went to go you know and so my experience of the leadership the activist crowd in this country at least 
has been incredibly disappointing. You know, it's just not interested in impact. Um, and I'm not really fundamentally interested in doing this from my own personal credentials. Like, I don't really feel the need to add anything more. You know, I mean, I am content with what I've achieved. It may not be a huge amount. I have a PhD. I've written three books. I have a business. You know, I have a fellowship at the LSE. You know, I've written in the Financial Times and the Independent. So at least in terms of the things that I want to do, I'm reasonably happy. I don't need any more credentials. But I think kind of leveraging on this activism purely so that you can be seen and you can put a selfie on your Instagram and blah, blah. Yeah, there's a problem for sure in this country, Canada. In the UK, I, I reserve judgment a bit because I haven't spent as much of my energy and time in that community. But for sure, we have a problem. We have a problem with people who just need to be validated. Look at me. I'm really important. I'm so important. Yeah, without realizing that, bloody hell, you're no more important than eight other billion people on the planet and you'll be dead in 50 years. So, I mean, you'd be food for worms. So, like, that's really important. I'm food for worms. That's really important. It's like, dude, you know what? It's like, obviously, I'm frustrated because, I, because I've, I've experienced this firsthand. I've spent a lot of time, money, and energy in trying to help the community here, here in Canada. And I think I've just realized that you don't really have people here who want to have an impact. Impact is really, you know, it's not about yourself. It's about, it's not about yourself, basically. Absolutely. No, I think it's it's not just the Canada. I mean, I've heard people from the US say the same thing, and definitely in the, in the UK, it, it does seem to be that there's many that want to be seen to be making an impact rather than making the actual impact. And, you know, even recently there was a, a Muslim group that had an iftar with the, the Labour Party leader over here and it caused a massive uproar, especially on social media. Um, and it seems like, we, you know, we're, we're ready to, to sh shoot people down and, and without understanding what the context is or anything, whether the, the ones that had the dinner were right or wrong is, 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 is a question up for debate and it should be for debate. But the response to it is just like angry, you know, victim mindset almost uh, that, you know yeah, they weren't invited anything, but but they weren't invited they weren't invited had they been invited they'd be very <laughs> that yeah hands down whether they turned up i'm not entirely sure but they weren't invited i mean i saw that controversy with mudassar and concordia and all the rest of it i was like who cares yeah. who cares you know why is it such a big deal but it's a big deal if you weren't invited you know? yeah and i did actually to your point, what I will also say is that there's an interesting conversation that I had about a particular project that I'm doing in the Muslim community in the UK. I rang up a person to interview them to get them their, to get them their thoughts, um, to get to get their thoughts. Sorry, um, and then I rang up a second person and I casually mentioned that I'd just spoken to this person, and he'd given me his high level. And he said, "You spoke to that person before me." I said, "Well, yeah. Why was the problem?" Well, in that case, you know what. Why don't you go speak to him again? Put the phone down. Wow. I was like, hmm, nice to know. You know, it's like, put the ego aside. Remember your food for worms. Okay, you're no more important by, you're not at all remotely more important than the 8 billion people on the planet. Some of whom are beggars, some of whom are kings and queens. Okay. And now let's just try and have an impact. And that ruthlessness, I think, is actually important. I think, my generation has more of that focus than previous generations, I'd like to think. And I think the younger gener our younger generation will have that a little bit more. I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic that they will be a bit more like, you know, impact, dude. Let's not talk about how amazing you are or how special you are or how brilliant you are. It's irrelevant. No, absolutely love it. And, and, and you know, I'm just looking at the time and it's absolutely flown by. I really enjoyed uh, this conversation so any last words for, for people watching this uh, you know people are struggling with their minotaurs any last words from you and what message do you have for those people that are struggling um, and, and, and how can you motivate and inspire them right uh, last message is you have one life on this earth respect it like respect it treat it with treat it with the respect that it deserves you don't know how long you're going to have it for it could be six hours it could be six weeks it could be six months it could be six decades i have no idea nor do you i know too many people 
who in their 20s and 30s and 40s thought they had at least till the end of the year to live or the, or the next decade and didn't survive. Wow. Many of my closest friends passed away very suddenly. Some mm. of my family members have passed away very suddenly. Driving in a car, car accident, bang, over. Okay, so respect your life, respect the time that you have, okay, and do the things that you do for yourself. Like stop worrying about what people will say. Stop worrying about all of that stuff. Free yourself up from these chains. You don't need them. You have that one life. It does not. You don't. You don't want that life to be one. When you look back and say, you know, well, I pretty much satisfy what everybody else wanted. It's like, live it, live that life, respect it, go out and do amazing things. Like, you know, it's just you who's stopping you. Oh, it's very, very beautiful and very profound. Thank you for that. Um, and just before we wrap up then, what projects are you working on? Who would you like to contact you and how can they contact you? Well, my book launch, I couldn't ignore that. Being Muslim today is about to come out very soon. Um, I'm very proud of that work, actually. Uh, it's a lifetime of more than 35 years of thinking and debating and researching and reading and all the rest of it have gone into this. I'm really, really pleased with that. Um, beyond that, I have a website, sakibqureshi.com. If you want to keep in touch, I have a newsletter that goes out. I can't really talk about some of the projects that I'm working on because they're quite, quite, quite confidential, but there's a whole universe that I'm pushing out in terms of debt-free real estate investing, uh, specifically around two angles. Um, those people who want to learn how to do it and those people who want for me to do it for them. Um, so debt-free. So it's like, you know, literally is debt-free. So we don't have to get involved about lease and interest rates and all the rest of it. And so that's something that's quite important to me going forward because the Muslim community wants debt-free real estate investing. So I've got programs with respect to helping people do it and I've got programs with respect to look if you don't want to do it you know I'll do it for you uh, and information on that is on sakibqureshi.com or you can grab hold of me on LinkedIn and send me a message as well excellent I, I will drop the links to those in the description below Dr. Sakib thank you once again for being here it's been an absolute pleasure hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and for the viewer I hope you enjoyed this episode it definitely was uh, a banger for me and I will see you on the next one take care now bye bye bye